So listen to this, for sports brands the players are like walking billboards and nothing compares to the World Cup. If the brands are already willing to bend over backwards for 5 seconds of ad space in the Super Bowl halftime show that's watched by 100 million people, then what would they be willing to do for 90 minutes of publicity in the World Cup final that's watched by over a billion? It's like Brazilian legend and world champion Tustão once said, Back in my time, the army ruled the country so they picked the starting 11. Now, the sponsors are the ones who rule the world, who do you think is picking the team? There's no doubt the big sponsors play a huge role, especially in the biggest of tournaments, but it was never as obvious as in 1998. The corruption was off the charts throughout the whole year, as someone once said, if they knew what happened, they would be disgusted. And in the final, it all hit unprecedented levels. Bribing, poisoning, medical malpractice, lobbying, censoring, wiretapping. If you're to believe the theories, then they checked off every crime in the book, and it all started because of Ronaldo. Back in 98, he was just 21 years old, but had already played six full seasons for four different clubs, Cruzeiro, PSV, Barcelona and Inter, scoring 179 goals in 200 matches, winning the Ballon d'Or, the Confederations Cup, the Cup Winners Cup, the Copa America, the UEFA Cup and even the World Cup in 94, despite not playing a single minute. He was easily the best player in the world and seemed to be completely on route to become the undisputed greatest of all time, with only Pele being able to rival his numbers at such a young age. Regardless, if he had one rival back then, it was Zinedine Zidane. Already 26, he was much more experienced, easily the best midfielder in the world and had dominated Italy, even closing out the club season in 98 by beating Ronaldo to the Serie A title. So once the World Cup came around, they were easily the two biggest stars of the tournament and to bring the heat up a notch, Brazil and France ended up meeting in the final. As much as they were the two favorites, the general opinion was that Brazil would trash France regardless, as even though the tournament was played precisely in France, Brazil were seen as stronger and had gotten the easier path to the final, facing Chile, Denmark and the Netherlands, and Ronaldo had been in much better form than Zidane, scoring five goals and assisting another three in the six matches that preceded the final, while the Frenchman, despite being as silky smooth as ever, had as many red cards as goal contributions throughout those same matches. If there was any doubt that France feared Brazil much more than they feared them, surely seeing how their defenders talked about Ronaldo in training, swearing he was some kind of magician who could make the ball disappear on command, was enough to set the record straight. Ronaldo was the most feared man on the planet. At least, that was until the afternoon before the final. The entire squad arrived at the hotel and went into their rooms and immediately, things got weird. With Roberto Carlos claiming he found Ronaldo down on his knees crying, apparently struggling to deal with the pressure of having to revalidate his country's World Cup title at such a young age. After all, Brazil quite simply had to win. Still, this moment of weakness was nothing compared to the desperation that came next. Shortly after lunch, on his way back to the room, Ronaldo dropped to the floor, foaming at the mouth, clenching his jaw and shaking uncontrollably, to the point that Edmundo, one of the players who witnessed it all, claims he had to try to restrain him so he wouldn't hurt himself. As more people arrived at the scene, Ronaldo struggled to even breathe, when suddenly, after about 40 seconds of chaos, he stopped, and at that exact moment the hotel manager rushed to help as he heard several players yelling, he is dead. But suddenly Ronaldo opened his eyes and said to the players, go to the other room, I can't sleep with all that noise. Yeah, I am not kidding. Everyone was in shock, they could not figure out what happened, so they just sat around waiting for him to wake up. Zico, the second coach at the time, even got him to react for a second time, but he just stared at him with a blank expression and went back to sleep. One hour later, he finally got back to his senses. A bit dizzy, confused and feeling like he had been hit by a truck, Ronaldo was taken for a walk in the hotel's garden by teammate Leonardo, who slowly filled him in on what had happened. So far, all the medical team had done was offer Ronaldo a cup of tea. One of the doctors, Joaquin de Mata, would eventually admit that he had never even seen anyone experiencing a convulsion. Hours went by before Ronaldo was finally rushed to the hospital, arriving only once the sun had already set. After the first examinations, their assessment was that he was probably an undiagnosed epileptic, but then they ran every test possible and they couldn't find out what was wrong with him. In the words of the man himself, it was like I had never 
never had a convulsion. It was all so eerily normal that by the time Ronaldo had to go to sleep, he quite simply couldn't, he was just too scared it would happen again. Still, he got through the night and eventually the doctors diagnosed it as an episodic convulsion triggered by emotional distress. Regardless, while all of this was going on, Brazil's coach Zagallo had shocked the world by announcing the team sheet without Ronaldo's name on it, playing Edmundo in his place as he was completely convinced he wouldn't make it back in time for the game. But with the final diagnosis seeming harmless just 40 minutes before kickoff, Ronaldo went against the doctor's orders and declared himself fit to play, convincing the coach to start him after a lengthy discussion. But once the broadcast started, everyone could see something was off. The usually lively Brazilian squad walked onto the pitch with their shoulders slumped, staring into the ground. Ronaldo himself looked more like he had been dragged onto the pitch rather than having begged to be on it. Once the anthem started, the Brazilian fans were shocked to see that Ronaldo not only looked tired and sleepy, but presented an oddly yellowish skin tone like that of someone with jaundice. After kickoff, the exuberant football Brazil had played all tournament was nowhere to be seen, instead they were completely disorganized and Ronaldo was like a shadow. Once scared to death of facing him, Desai and Thuram completely caged him, completely denying him every single time which only made it more weird when the full 90 minutes went by without him ever being subbed off. With all of this added together, the result was two goals from two corners, both scored by Zidane, then followed by a third goal, even though Desai Desai had left friends playing with just 10 men. It had, against all expectations, been one of the most one-sided World Cup finals in history, with Zidane at the center of all of it, which just a few months later allowed him to pry the Ballon d'Or away from Ronaldo's hands. But still, despite all of this, Ronaldo seemed fine. As he was interviewed after the match, he said, I may have lost the World Cup, but I have won the Cup of Life. At least, I can keep on playing football. Which was especially ironic as following the World Cup he would begin feeling constant pain on both his knees, which would culminate in his tragic injury just a couple of months later that would leave him on the sidelines for two full years, becoming one of football's greatest tragedies. But here is where it all took a turn. These half-baked explanations regarding what happened in the 24 hours that preceded the World Cup final were never enough to convince anyone. Something just didn't seem right about that match, and the fans began searching for real answers, prompting several different conspiracies. One of the first few to come out was quite simple. They believed that in fact Ronaldo had already been dealing with pain in his knees for a while and had been treated for it with a substance known as lidocaine, which the doctor had failed to properly administer, injecting Ronaldo with a dosage higher than prescribed. But the funny thing about lidocaine, it is heavily sensitive to errors in its dosage and the side effects that an error like that could spawn are exactly convulsions and long-lasting ligament damage, which could have led to his nearly career-ending injury a few months later. However, as you might imagine, the doctor in question had insisted all of this was complete nonsense, saying no player in the team was even taking any sort of injectables, which led to another theory. Many players claimed they saw another one of the members of the medical staff, Lady Toledo, crying after he saw the state Ronaldo was in and in fact, that doctor in specific never ruled Ronaldo out for the match, eventually even saying, imagine I had stopped him from playing and Brazil went on to lose, the entire country would blame me, I would have to move to the North Pole. Which prompted the question of whether or not this doctor had given Ronaldo the green light in order to save himself from criticism despite knowing he wasn't fit to play. But well, these are nothing compared to the next theory. Could Ronaldo have been poisoned? After all, they were playing friends in France and Ronaldo just happened to randomly collapse right after having lunch in a French hotel, could someone in the hotel staff have risked it all trying to give his country the edge that could take them towards glory? We'll never know, but to be fair, all of these theories look like little details in a much, much more complex plot to rig the final. So here are the two most widespread theories that most people believe to this very day. The first one, France paid off Brazil to throw the match. Days after the match, a letter supposedly written by someone inside the Brazilian Football Federation leaked and began being spread across the internet. The letter accused every single organization involved in the final of corruption. Famously reading, if you knew what really happened, you would be disgusted. The latter claimed the Brazilian Federation had thrown the match in exchange for the chance to host a World Cup in the future, which coincidentally, or not, they would be awarded just five years later. 
On the other hand, the players supposedly accepted massive bribes in order to go along, with the exception of Ronaldo, who refused to play along, leading the Federation to make up the entire story that he was sick, though he would eventually cave in, leading to his unexpected last-minute call back to the starting lineup. However, there was one aspect about this leak that ruined the entire theory. It was then exposed as a fake, a hoax. The letter had supposedly been written by one of the very first internet trolls. It allegedly held no truth to it whatsoever, or at least it was what everyone thought, until an article by The Guardian came out attempting to expose the entire situation, even adding further details to the story, claiming Brazil had also demanded from FIFA that they rig the next World Cup's group stage draw in their favor. And once again, it seemed like too much coincidence that in 2002 they drew a group that contained China, Costa Rica and Turkey, winning every single match with an aggregate score of 11-3, the best tally in their entire history. And if those two coincidences weren't enough to raise suspicion among the fans, then The Guardian also exposed the fact that suspiciously, just as the story broke the day before the final, the cell phone lines had stopped working in the area surrounding the stadium and the team's hotel, making it impossible for any journalist to reach the players or interrogate them regarding the events that transpired. Yeah, things smelled fishy to say the very least, but still, what many ask is, why did the players go along with all of this? Well, it is believed only a few of them were actually in on it. The French seemed completely oblivious of it all, with Peter saying that every one of them thought all along that Ronaldo would end up playing and that it had all been a massive bluff from the Brazilians trying to throw them off before the match, while on the other side, many point to one specific moment midway through the match when Rivaldo strangely gave away possession in a 70th something minute in a completely unnecessary act of fair play, despite being 2 0 down at that point already, which led Edmundo to nearly beat him up in frustration, clearly showing that Edmundo could have never been in on the whole plot if it was indeed real. It was obvious he was one of the very few truly actively trying to win the match. Overall, this specific theory shouldn't surprise anyone. It was not the first or the last time that FIFA had been involved in a corruption scandal. That very same tournament started with one, as several members of FIFA had accepted bribes in order to sway the host selection in favor of Morocco. And if that isn't enough to convince you, in 2015, French ex-UEFA president Michel Platini admitted that at the very least he was aware that the group stage draw had been set up so that Brazil and France could only face each other in the final so that France could stay away from the one team they truly feared, famously saying, you think others don't do that at their World Cups? <laughs> Even Emmanuel Petit, the scorer of the third goal, went on to say, sometimes I wonder if that match was truly won on the pitch, if I was anything more than a puppet. I think it's easy to see why so many people would be inclined to believe this theory already, but in fact, this isn't even the most widely believed theory. Once again, there seems to be a much bigger plot that completely changes the narrative of all we've discussed so far. People believe that Nike was behind all of it, that it was Nike who forced Ronaldo to play the World Cup final. Think about it, back then it was a battle of brands. Nike sponsored Ronaldo and Brazil, Adidas sponsored Zidane and France. But then suddenly Ronaldo gets sick right before the biggest event on the planet. The damage that could cause Nike was immense. Not only was he the star of the tournament, but he had been the one to debut their greatest, flashiest, most heavily marketed product that very same year. The iconic Nike Mercurials with them even building him a custom model for the World Cup specifically. These boots would go on to become the most profitable model in history. Nike were aware of his potential and they were not bound to risk it all just because the player was feeling unwell. According to the theory, they didn't even have to contact the player themselves. Just a few years earlier, they had signed a sponsorship contract with the Brazilian Federation worth £160 million, the largest in history. One of the clauses was quite simple. Brazil had to fill their best 11 every time they could, even friendlies. And the person who would be profiting the most from all of this was President Ricardo Teixeira, who would eventually be accused of pocketing a huge chunk of that money and was seen going into the locker room for around 20 minutes the day of the final, right before it was suddenly announced that Ronaldo was back on the starting lineup. It was already obvious what had happened there. He had communicated to Ronaldo that if he were to miss a match, Nike would cancel Ronaldo's lifetime sponsorship contract worth $80 million. 
No wonder the moment they lost his immediate reaction was to take off his boots, tie their laces together and wear them around his neck. After all, every time they appeared on screen, he was making money. But yeah, most importantly, the fallout of all of this was what made the theory even more compelling. Two years later, the Federation's president was forced to justify his actions in the Brazilian parliament itself, somehow having to explain how in the years after signing their biggest sponsorship deal ever with Nike, the Federation began losing money for the first time in their history, taking out absurd loans to cover expenses with interest rates of up to 43% from companies it was related with then suing two members of the parliament who wrote a book about the case and eventually even being called up to the parliament once again about 10 years later after trying to corrupt the organization of the 2014 World Cup in Brazil, which eventually led to his resignation as the parliament agreed that prosecuting him would be a bad image for the country. And even worse than that, Edmundo, who never seemed to let go of his frustration regarding the final, would go on to be recorded without his knowledge talking about the subject in the backstage of one of his interviews, saying, That Nike thing is real, and not even just the final, they had a contract, where Ronaldo had to play every match in every single minute. They didn't even have to say anything, there was no middleman, they had negotiated the contract directly with the president, he had taken a percentage of the profits. <laughs> To the surprise of no one, eventually was forced to post a public letter apologizing to Nike and the president and even went on to sue the people who recorded him. But yeah, to end it all, if you're wondering what Ronaldo has to say about all of this, well, he claims to this very day he doesn't know what happened to him, that he was the one who convinced everyone to let him play, begging until they caved in that it was the tranquilizers the medics had given him for the pain that made him look so sluggish on the pitch, and that above all he thinks the drama threw the team off their game as they were simply all too worried about him. 